doing this, Rebecca for organizing it, and John for moderating. I really appreciate all the work you guys are putting in. Um, so yes, we're going to just jump right in here. Uh, this is my um, pollinator garden. This was four years ago. Um, and um, I want to talk today as we're going through these slides about the importance of native plants for ecosystem health. Um, and I'll do some plant ID and justification for why I plant things uh, that I do and, and why my yard looks the way it does. And, um, and I want you to keep in mind as we're going through um, what is eye candy to you versus what is eye candy to our critical pollinators. Um, you know, what are our native bees looking for when they come flying over our yards? All right. So um, I often start at these presentations with a question about how many bees can you name? And invariably, um, I get answers like, oh, well, there's bumblebees and there's uh, honeybees and there's yellow jackets. <laughs> to which I respond that yellow jackets are not a bee, they're a wasp. And so, but there are many, many other kinds of bees. There are sweat bees and squash bees and mason bees and furrow bees and digger bees and sunflower bees. And as you can see, we have a lot of them here in North America. Um, this is just a small representation of what we have um, in, our, in our country here. It's a great little poster. So many, many other bees are flying around your neighborhood and looking for floral resources. Um, so the goal uh, for me when I plant a native plant is I want it not only to be a nectar plant and pollen plant for bees, I want it to be a host plant for caterpillars, for moth and butterfly larvae, because moth and butterfly larvae are the important insect food of all of our nesting birds. If the birds don't have caterpillars to feed their young, we're not going to have birds, and birds are one of our vanishing wildlife resources. So this is my yard, and most of what you're seeing right here are non-natives. They are not native plants. They are um, iris, there are um, shasta daisies, even this lupin is a non-native, it's a cultivar lupin. Um, so this was what the garden looked like. It's now it's in, in transition, now we're in May of 2018, and there are some native plants coming up in this that you really can't see just yet. So let's move on here. So first of all, um, in the center there, you're seeing Veronica spicatum, which is a, um, a non-native, but a, a very good pollinator plant for our bees. It, spring, it opens very early in the spring, and it is um, really, really beloved of uh, bumblebees, love this stuff. Um, but most of them back here, we have some hazelnut, um, which actually produces pollen really, really early in the spring for our bees. Um, this is June. This is what the garden kind of looks like in June. There are some um, native Coreopsis down here in the front. These are uh, tick seed. Um, and as we go through these slides, you're going to actually see um, some highlighted green text. This highlighted text to tell you about how many species of butterfly and moth a plant hosts. So you can see here that the areogonum, this native right here, this is a native, one of our native asters, um, it hosts um, 16 species of butterfly and moth. And so I am always looking for plants that host the most number of butterfly and moth species. This is the same year, it says it's June of 2018, and this is the goldenrod in my side yard. I live on a corner, so all of this is visible from two streets. My poor neighbors. Um, <laughs> this is West Coast goldenrod, really, really one of the critically important native plants for our late migrating uh, butterflies. Um, they have to have these flowers to nectar at, um, and these are very drought tolerant plants. 
and are a great source of pollen and nectar for our bees and butterflies. So you can see 49 species of moth and butterfly lay their eggs in this. This is a California spice bush. And you can see by that little number two, it's a pretty plant. It's a great kind of foundation plant and it's great in hedgerows and stuff and in riparian areas, but it's not a powerhouse plant. It does not host that many things. Not that many caterpillars can eat this. And so it's of little value for birds when they're seeking food for their young. Same thing with milkweed. We want you to plant milkweed for the monarch butterflies because they have to lay their eggs on milkweed but they are the only species of butterfly that lays their egg. This, of course, is a swallowtail, not a monarch. Many things will come to uh, milkweed flowers to nectar and gather pollen, but only the monarch can lay its eggs there. So you can see this is a tiger swallowtail, western tiger swallowtail. And here, of course, is the monarch, and this is a monarch on some uh, narrow-leaf milkweed. And here's one of the monarchs that I tagged and released um, two summers ago when we actually had some monarch butterflies around. Um, this is one of our natives. This is a California fuchsia and it comes in kind of many varieties depending on where in California it grows or in the Rogue Valley where it grows. We have these in the Rogue, um, in the Rogue River Basin. They grow right up on the Rock Canyon walls. Um, very, very drought tolerant a very, very long blooming into the fall and incredibly attractive to hummingbird. Plus they host 25 species of moth and butterfly. What's not to love about that? All right, this is my yard. This is kind of what my yard, we're going into winter now. This is what it looks like in December. A um, lot of little finches up there in the trees. And oh darn, when you walk by my house now, or in any time of the winter between, say, November and mm, March, it's actually going to look like this. And um, I know that that's offensive to some people, but the reason for doing that is that this litter provides overwintering sites for hundreds of species of caterpillar, of, of moth and butterfly, and even fly species that need to have winter cover. And if you think I'm talking about just house flies, we'll get to that later. Um, so stems, leaves, seed heads provide overwintering opportunities. Um, they provide habitat for bees and moths, butterflies, and winter seed forage for birds. So the birds come in here, they glean seeds out of this all winter long. And um, just as an example of a fly that overwinters in leaf litter, this little guy is called a long-legged fly. And he eats fungus gnats and aphids and thrips, all the things that come into your garden and destroy your vegetables. This little guy is hunting in your yard. If you clean up all your leaves and you rake them into a bag and you send them to be ground up and composted, you're destroying this guy and all the little summer butterflies that you want to see in your garden. So thousands of native flies overwinter in leaf litter. So you should leave the leaves somehow tucked under your bushes in your yard. Okay, our non-migratory and elevationally migratory, uh, migrating birds um, depend on this sort of dense evergreen foliage that I have in my yard um, for protection from winter weather. So when you're planning your yards, you want to plan for from ground cover all the way up into the canopy, um, both deciduous and evergreen um, ground covers, herbs, trees, and shrubs, so that you're providing this multi-dimensional, both vertical and horizontal habitat for our birds who need to have protection during the winter. Um, so that's, you know, you look out and it looks like a bunch of sticks and just grass and all that stuff and oh my gosh, but you know what? I've got tons of birds visiting my yard. This little guy is a, an orange crowned warbler these are house finches. This is a yellow rumped warbler. This is a downy woodpecker. This is the house finch again. I also have purple finches. Um, these, <laughs> these little guys are bush tits and they're so darling. And once again, these are guys who come down for the winter into the valley and they, and they move in flocks and they glean insects 
all up and down in the vegetation. They move in little, in little gleaning guilds through your trees and shrubs, and they clean off, they pick off insects. They're great little dudes. So these three signs are posted to inform passersby um, why my yard looks the way it does. And the certifications are from the Xerces Society, I am a certified pollinator garden. Monarch Watch has certified me as a monarch way station. The National Wildlife Federation has certified me as a wildlife habitat. So the requirements for those all are that you have to have water, you have to have host and pollinator plants, you need to not use pesticides, and you need diverse vegetation and habitat. So, you know, we suffer through the winter looking at what people think doesn't look right. Of course, it looks like nature. Nature doesn't own a leaf blower or a rake or a lawnmower or a garden shredder. Um, but April comes around and things start to grow and this is what the yard starts to look like. It kind of like nature, <laughs> things come up and turn green. Um, so new growth comes up through that debris. This is the side yard. This is on Spring Street. The other corner was Todd Circle where I live. Um, so here is the, um, service berry that is just, you can just see these white blooms here starting to bloom. This is, this is not, this is a non-native plant here, but these are service berry blooms. Service berry is one of our really powerful native plants hosting 81 species. And here's a little native bee. Um, our little native bees start coming out in March. Um, and sometimes it only trees and shrubs are providing pollen and nectar for them at that point. So this is a shrub, a flower of cystus, uh, a non-native shrub, but obviously of value to this furrow bee. Um, once again, the birds are still coming. I, I'm hoping to get rid of my bird feeders eventually, but um, in the meantime, they're eating the seeds that are on the ground and on the stems. Um, so this is what it looks like again in April. Um, we're moving, moving through the seasons again. I want to point out that the, the native nine bark that you see in that upper kind of left corner, that purple plant, um, is problematic. When I planted it, I knew nine bark was a native, but I liked the purple one at the nursery because it was eye candy to me. Um, but our, uh, our butterflies and moths aren't going to lay their eggs on that because their caterpillars aren't accustomed to the purple, the um, chemicals that make that purple color in the foliage. So when you're choosing a native plant, you want to plant the straight native, the one that grows in the wild, because that's what our native insects are looking for. The caterpillars can't deal with those um, chemicals that make the, the leaf color purple. They haven't evolved with that. So um, this is just a picture of some lupin and of course the non-native Shasta daisies. There's still a lot of those in my yard, but our native lupins are once again, really keystone power plants that host 55 species of moth and butterfly. And, um, and then I wanted to point out, you can barely see it behind this lupin, that yellow blossom there are, and this plant as well, although it's past its bloom time. Um, those are golden currants. Also another one of those terrific native plants um, that are an important source of early pollen and nectar for our, uh, and ribes, I think they host something like 90, 90 species of, of caterpillar. Um, this is red clover that I put down as a cover crop to just enrich the soil and my side yard. Um, and then I mow it down before it goes to seed and it just adds nitrogen and sequesters carbon and feeds the soil microorganisms. Also provides great nectar for, for bees. Not a, not a native, but a good thing to use. Um, the tree back here with these weird dark blossoms is a pawpaw tree. It's an Eastern North American native um, that hosts 12 different species of uh, butterfly. And then in front of that, is these purple flowers are meadow rue. And you can see here's June. This is a little skipper on my cat mint, which is obviously not, cat mint is not a native plant, but the little skipper butterflies that 
that overwinter in the grass in my front yard are back in my backyard on the cat mint, nectaring at the, at the cat mint. Um, painted lady on the borage. Obviously, borage is not a native plant, but it's a great nectar source for some of our um, migrating butterflies. Here's that front yard again. Uh, Non-native purple flax. I've got some prairie sun rudbeckia and Asiatic lilies. None of those are native. Um, so a lot of what is flowering here, you're not seeing uh, natives. Those are those Asiatic lilies again. They're really spectacular and beautiful. People love to look at them. The only thing I've ever seen on them is a, is a swallowtail butterfly nectaring. They're not of much use for the bees. This, however, that flea bane is. This is milkweed in full bloom and it is showy. Once you get a clump established, not only is it showy, it's incredibly fragrant and it is utilized by tons of different pollinators. The, the flowers are very attractive to bees of all varieties. Here's a little carpenter bee. Here's a little um, leaf cutter bee. Um, this is not the milkweed, of course, this, but this is another uh, blooming plant. This is a valerian in my yard and this is a thread-waisted wasp. There's that swallowtail and those Asiatic lilies. And then I'm gonna move to the front yard kind of near my front door uh, at night. These are um, evening primroses. And um, the evening primroses are an incredibly important um, plant for our nighttime pollinators. And I'm gonna pull this down and get rid of my notes for a minute and go to the next slide, Oops, sorry. I don't know if you can see this very well. My camera, of course, does not have a, a fast enough shutter to catch this guy. This is a white line sphinx moth. That's his butt right there. And that's a wing. And there's the other wing. Of course, it's moving too fast for my camera, but you can go out at night about dusk and watch these flowers all open within about a three minute period. They will just start to unfold at night. They open at night and they close again in the morning. And then, I went out a half an hour after dark and I was looking around and I had two of these giant moths coming to this plant. So when we're choosing plants for our garden, we need to think about what is important for our nighttime pollinators as well. And these um, evening primroses can get kind of large and rangy, but they provide seed for all our little finches in winter and they provide incredibly important um, forage for our nighttime moths. And this is what the caterpillar of that hawk moth looks like on that same type of plant, that same evening primrose. Um, these are sunflower bees visiting, obviously, a sunflower. And by the way, they will go to any helianthus. So they like any kind of um, member of the helianthus, the sunflower genera. And of course, this is a non-native, but you can see it's just full of these little bees gathering pollen as fast as they possibly can, because each of those is a female provisioning a nest somewhere within 300 feet of that sunflower. This is what they, um, the garden starts to look like in fall. Things are dying back, but um, right these plants now for me are blooming. They didn't open until November. They didn't open until like early this month. These swamp sunflowers, which are a helianthus, and these asters. These are a, actually a, an Eastern North American aster, but they're prolific and they're providing enormous floral resource for our bees. So, um, and then fall in the garden kind of looks like this. There are the grass bunches that I leave up, seeds for the birds and nesting sites for little skippers like this. This is another kind of skipper. This is a checkered skipper. And once again, they nest in those bunches of dead grass stalks. They overwinter in those. Um, so then my yard starts to look pretty funky again. 
Um, you can see my water for my birds. I've got some hanging bird feeders there. My husband likes to grow his fruit trees in pots because it's hard to dig in our soil. And so you have those ugly pots showing with all the fruit trees in them. Oh, uh, well, that's just life. This is, um, and then when spring starts coming around again, this is again a yellow faced bumblebee in that um, golden um, current that I told you about, the Ribes aureum. Um, and I have a lot of yellow faced bumblebees in my yard. And I have a few strange plants like this pipe vine. The reason we're growing pipe vine here is because it is the only, it, it has one species of butterfly that utilizes it. But it's such a spectacular butterfly that, you know, kind of like the monarch, we want to plant the plant that's going to attract those female butterflies. And here she is, this beautiful pipe vine butterfly. She's got this funny looking caterpillar. And the only thing she lays her eggs in are these pipe vines that are sort of a riparian. They're in stream canyons and stuff in, in Northern California. And they, and they do get up into the Klamath Mountains. So, we're growing them here in our yard. This is that service berry again. It's starting to bloom in the spring. It's starting to bud out and leaf out. Um, here's what the yard starts to look like again as you're looking up toward the house from Spring Street. These are some of my little meadow species that I've, that I've planted. Um, little native annual wildflowers. This is meadow foam. Um, this is blue flax and even these little herbs, these small tiny wildflowers can host enormous amounts of butterflies and moths. So if you're going to be growing flowers in your yard, please consider growing annual and perennial wildflowers. They're really, really important to our native pollinators. The yellow flower here is Oregon sunshine. Um, it sort of looks mm, like a chrysanthemum. Um, but nice single flower that the bees can easily access that disc with all those florets in it that are full of pollen and nectar. Um, you always want to choose single flower varieties that you're putting in your garden because if you do doubles, they're number one, they're not going to make any seeds for the birds. Number two, the our bees can't get into them. They're, they're not, they don't produce pollen and nectar. They're not usable by insects. This is um, that tick seed again, Coreopsis. And there's one of those little furrow bees. Once again, she's loading up the pollen onto her legs for transport to a nest that she's building, probably underground. Um, we have bees that build nests in hollow stems. We have bees that build nests in the ground. This again is that yellow faced bumblebee on some phacelia. This is scorpion weed, which is one of the early blooming and long blooming natives that is absolutely fabulous uh, for our, our bumblebees. They love this stuff. This was covered in bees. All kinds of, I don't even know what this guy is. I just took a picture of him because he's so cute, um, but totally covered with all kinds of different pollinators, this scorpion weed. And some of those flowers look kind of rangy and wild. It's because they are. Uh, but it's what bees are looking for when they come to your yard. Um, this is a native of the northeast of the United States. This is called false indigo or Baptisia. It's kind of a loose, kind of looks like a loosely open lupin. It's a member of the pea flam family. So it's sequestering carbon and fixing nitrogen and building soil in your yard. Um, and it has pretty, pretty winter pods, black, big black pods in the winter that are very pretty. Here's a sweat bee. This is one of our little metallic bees um, on some white Dutch clover, not a native plant, but uh, some of our native bees can utilize that. This is a uh, Clarkia, one of our native, um, they're called Farewell to Spring, and we have many different varieties of those here in the Rogue Valley. Um, this is Eastern milkweed. It is called butterfly weed. Um, pretty, pretty plant for your garden beds. If you have to have a more restrained and formal flower bed than I have, this might be a good choice, but it does need a lot more water than our, nest, our Western native milkweeds. Um, the butterflies will utilize it. 
uh, but it's, it's kind of more contained. It grows in a clump rather than spreading. And all milkweeds are very slow growing, so you won't get a big clump for three or four years. This is uh, showy milkweed again. It is pretty spectacular when it's in full bloom. It's amazingly fragrant. You can smell it from a block away. Um, and this is a pear tree there in our, uh, on the far side of our house from Spring Street and some pineapple guava. Oh, there's a, there's a picture of back into the yard. Remember those pots that you were looking at earlier that were so ugly in winter? They're back in here. This is a fruit tree that's sitting in one of those pots and you, you can't see them anymore. The vegetation grows up and covers those. So we have serviceberry here. We have Crocosmia, which is a member of the iris family that's non-native, but the hummingbirds, I grow it for the hummingbirds. This is Monarda, one of our Eastern North American native plants called, um, it's called bee balm and is very, very beloved by our bumblebees. Um, there's a, a close-up on the Monarda. This is the service berry in fruit, uh, full of robins. This whole part of the yard is full of robins pulling these berries off and eating these. And there's more of that scorpion weed and some of, this is scorpion weed, and this is that evening primrose. Notice the flowers are closed because it's daytime. They're not going to open up until night. Um, and a, just another look at the, the yard from the front sidewalk back to the trees. This is a pecan tree. Um, this is that swamp milkweed. That's that um, spruce tree back in the back. And this is hazelnut here. This is one of our Eastern North American natives, um, Leatris spicata, also a, a member of the aster family and a very, very good um, and attractive flower for um, for bees and it adds some vertical interest in your yard if you're into those design kinds of things. <laughs> People that are into design look at my yard in horror, you know, I just, I throw stuff willy nilly. This is once again a side yard on Spring Street, showy milkweed, goldenrod, that's that spice bush and back here is a red twig dogwood that grows like gangbusters out there. Uh, more of that service berry in bloom. Um, another shot of the front yard later in the season. So, um, yeah, I think I pointed out all those. These are the currants of that golden current. Hello. <laughs> and um, and then these are close-ups of the flowers on my pineapple guava, which is a, actually fruits in my yard. Um, and the pear tree. And then we go back to the front. And that's what my watering supply looks like. Uh, it's just a little puddler that the bees can get down to the water and then if they fall in, they can get back up out of onto those rocks and get, so nothing's drowning in there. But the birds and the bees use that. Um, then we have some fruit trees out front. We've got flowering mulberry and, or fruity mulberry and plums and some peaches. We've got strawberries growing wild under those fruiting trees um, as a ground cover. And then more of my wildflowers, just the clarkia and the scorpion weed. And this is a little blue gilia. Um, even that little flower, that little tiny flowering plant Host some of our moths and butterflies. Um, this is cell peel. It's a really great ground cover. It's a little member of the mint family and it has a little purple flower spike. Um, bees are all over that stuff. Really nice little ground cover, native ground cover. And I wanted to just point out to you that people go, oh, but you know, if I plant all these things that my caterpillars are going to be eating, my yard, everything's going to be shredded in my yard and I, it's going to look horrible. And yeah, well, cool your jets because look at this plant. Do you see, this is a service berry. This is Amelanchier, a native plant. Do you see any caterpillar damage on that plant from this distance? No, but if you step up close, there it is. They're on there. They're eating. The plants are used to this. The caterpillars are used to this, and you just have to do the 10-step program. 
take 10 steps back and look at the native plant. If you're not noticing that it's being defoliated, then everything is fine in your yard. So really, really important, I think, for everybody to consider uh, when you're making plant choices in your garden, how are you going to help biodiversity? How are you going to help um, stabilize ecosystems and improve uh, habitat and forage for our declining insect populations? And really the only way to do that is with native plants. And the, um, the estimation is at this point that you need to have about 70% of the biomass, that means the green foliage part of your yard, 70% of that needs to be in natives for you to have a stable, sustainable ecosystem for wildlife. Um, so, but you know, trees are a big part of biomass. So if you've got a couple native trees in your yard, you've probably got 50% of your biomass covered just by those. So an important thing to remember and keep in mind. So I wanna stop and, um, and allow for questions at this point because I do have quite a bit more information about my food garden. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, so we wanna break for questions and then, um, if those of you who want to leave, you don't want to stay for the entire thing to go see food back in the backyard, um, you can send me, if you want a PDF of the presentation, you can email me. That's my email address. If you would like to, um, this is a free program, but of course, um, if you feel like you benefited and you would like to donate to Jackson County Master Gardeners, um, we, we don't expect that. We, we would be thrilled if you were willing to do that. And there is a link there for you to do that if you, if you wish to do so. The other thing I wanna um, point out to people before you go, if you're leaving us now, after the questions during this break, um, is there is a, there's a program that I hope everybody <laughs> in the world will watch. And it's called The Nature's Best Hope. And that is, that link is there on this slide. And this is Dr. Doug Tallamy. And um, he is the researcher behind most of what I've been talking about today. Um, an entomologist at University of Delaware. And he will become your favorite um, university professor if you watch this presentation. I would tell you, get a glass of wine or a, or a cup of coffee or whatever your favorite beverage is, and sit down and spend an hour or so with this guy. Um, you will not be the same after you watch this. And he has a project called Homegrown National Parks. There's a website for that, and you can visit that as well. So, any questions? Hi, Lynn. Yes, we've got a few queued up here. I will right. start with the first one, which I actually share. Uh, do you rake the yard in late winter to provide more room for spring, plant, uh, spring plants to grow or just let everything lay where it falls? Yeah, I, I do not rake. And in fact, if I go in and cut down any of the stalks, I lay them down in that litter because there may be uh, little bees nesting in those over winter. And I don't want to put those in the compost pile. I don't want them, um, you know, shredded or broken. I kind of, I kind of just lay them down with the leaf litter and the grass litter. I leave all that there over winter because once again, there's something like 14,000 species of little native fly that are overwintering in leaf litter. There are also tens of thousands of species of, of butterflies and moths that overwinter in the leaf litter. And as soon as you rake that up and throw it away or shred it, you have killed those organisms. So you're contributing to the, to the death of some of the <laughs> creatures that are trying to survive over the winter. They absolutely have to have leaf litter. If you don't like messy yards like mine, gently rake your leaves in under your foundation shrubs. Just rake them carefully. And, and the things that 
look, you won't even see them in there. They look like leaves. The, the chrysalises and cocoons actually look like leaves. And you will just rake them in under with the rest of the debris, and they'll be fine there under your shrubs, hidden away where they're not going to make your yard look messy. <laughs> please, please don't, don't go destroying the leaves. Um, it's, it's a, it's, yeah, it's scary to me to drive around and see everybody with those dozens of bags of raked up leaves. All I see now is death. <laughs> <laughs> it's really difficult. Okay, sorry. Actually, I, to add on to that, I'm, I'm curious about like the leaf shredding. I guess that would have the same effect, correct? Exactly. If you sh if you shred the leaves, it, if if there are cocoons and chrysalises in there, chances are they're not going to make it through the shredding process intact. Okay. They'll they'll help the decomposition of the leaves then because their little bodies will be all shredded along with the leaves. Yeah. 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 Okay, next question. Uh, we have someone who has a, uh, says, my lawn is bah Bahama grass, I know, and I want to seed it with uh, a native pollinator mix this spring. Any recommendations on how to effectively kill off the grass that doesn't involve glyphosate? Yes, absolutely. And there are lots of um, things on YouTube, lots of links on YouTube where you can actually see people demonstrating this. But what I did was I laid down cardboard and then covered with a thick layer of uh, wood chips. And, and the cardboard, because turf grass is very, very, very shallow rooted. If it's not getting water and it's not getting light, it dies, it will die. And so I, I, you know, I just spread that mulch. And then in the spring, you can come by and you can overseed with maybe a cover crop to, to something like clover, um, you know, an annual clover. You don't want to put a, a permanent clover like Dutch clover, but some kind of um, nitrogen fixing clover to add a green manure component to all of that. Um, or you can cover the wood chips with a, a compost, a, a good clean compost that doesn't have weed seeds in it, and then seed that with native um, wildflower mixes. The native wildflower mixes, you really want to be careful that you're getting a western native wildflower mix, one preferably from Oregon. And once again, you can look online for those, but if you just go to the store and you buy off the rack something that says wildflower mix in it, it's gonna be mostly wildflowers from Eastern North America. They are not going to be um, adapted to this environment. We have a hot, dry, Western environment here. You want the plants that are growing out there on the hillsides around here. And there are organizations here in the valley who do collect and sell those seeds. Klamasiskiu seeds is a great source for native, locally gathered um, flower seeds. So I would, I would recommend that you really do your research and um, you know, feel free to email me and ask further questions. Okay, great. Is scorpion weed a perennial? It is not. That's an annual. There are perennial scorpion weeds. So it's Phacelia is the genus name. Um, the one that I showed you was Phacelia tanacetifolia, and it's, it, it is an annual. But there are plenty of scorpion weeds. They're not as pretty to your eye, but they are some of the most sought after flowers. Uh, by our native bee species, both in abundance and variety of bees that visit those flowers. Um, they've been shown by, by studies to be one of the most um, attractive, one of the top five attractive flowers for our native mm -hmm. bees. Interesting. Okay, so next question. How easily does goldenrod transplant? Pretty easily. And, and the other thing you need to know about goldenrod is like any native, if it gets a foothold and it's got a good site, it's going to spread like crazy on you. It is, it is going to take over the world because that's what it does. And it's, 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 very, it's a very rampant grower and it's pretty easy to transplant. It, it runs by these underground running roots and then it has other deeper roots that go down into the soil. It's, it's a very, very tough, tough plant. And so it's 
hard to kill. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. it wants to live. <laughs> so, okay, uh, next question. How do you water your garden? Sprinkler, drip? Yeah, I, I use, well, in the, in the pollinator gardens out front, I just have some stand pipes uh, with some overhead watering that I do. And I do that, I don't know, once a week um, for like a couple hours. And that's all it gets. In the back, in our food garden, we have a, a soaker hoses on raised, raised beds. And so it's a drip irrigation using those weepy pipes. Um, and so, and they're on timers. And so they get, they get daily water in the heat of, really heat of the summer. And, um, and then we can up and we can raise and lower the amount of time those get water, depending on temperature, yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is uh, an interesting question about the, the fires that we've gone through. How, how do you feel that, do you feel the ash? How is that going to affect the health of leaf mulch? Uh, well, the ash, the ash actually, I mean, because we're in the West and then all of our natives are fire adapted. In other words, a fire can come through, it will burn down all the vegetation. All the shrubs and uh, many of the trees will re-sprout from the base, from the roots that are left. And the ash just acts like fertilizer for them. Now, ash is gonna, you know, if, you, if you've got um, leaf litter around your house and you're worried about, I don't know if this is a question about fire danger, um, you know, so the ash is not gonna hurt anything in terms of, it's just gonna provide fertilizer, quick fertilizer for quick growth of native seeds. Um, in terms of fire danger, because people are concerned about that, if you have a defensible space around your house and you have maybe some leaf litter and some grasses growing there, those are going to go up in 20 seconds and it's not going to be a long enough flame to, to endanger your house. Your house has to be in contact with a, a hot ember or flame for something like 90 seconds for it to even ignite. If you drive by those little shacks that are in the field along between Phoenix and Medford, below the kind of, kind of, yeah, along the freeway there along the creek, you'll notice that they were in a grassy field and the whole field burned and the little sheds are still there intact. They were not damaged by the fire because of how fast the 20 seconds goes when a grass fire goes through. Huh. So. Something to, something to know about fire and, and, and our natives and how they're adapted. To yeah. That. yeah, yeah, it's a good case for, for growing natives. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to scorpion weed, do you, uh, does that reseed itself or do you reseed? It will, I, I just grew it for the first time this summer and I know people sell it as a, as a ground cover, as a, no, as a cover crop. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how well it's going to reseed. I plan, I collected the flower heads and I plan to sprinkle them out there again this coming year, but I'm assuming that it's going to reseed itself. Don't know. Um, and regarding your veggie garden, do you leave dead plants there? Uh, if so, do you worry about harboring disease, insects? Yeah, the veggie gardens. Yeah, the veggie gardens a little different. I I leave a little bit of mulch sometimes if I've got leftover um, summer straw or hay that I've used to mulch the vegetables. I might leave some of that on the beds, um, but usually I I clear the garden beds and I plant cover crops in them. So I really don't want a cover. I'm keeping a green manure crop. I'm keeping things growing there constantly. So I really don't have a lot of debris that I leave on the garden beds. And I can show you all that when I, when we get back, you know, into the next section, if you're, if you're hanging around. I, I think we're ready. All right. Okay. okay. Here we go. So this is the vegetable garden. And um, I use this wood waste from the plants, the kind of the hazelnuts and the spice bush and the red twig dogwood that I grow my, when those get too big, I cut them to the ground. It's called coppicing. And I cut them out. You can see these are pretty good stout branches and they're long. Hazel especially will get long, long, long growth when you cut it to the ground. 
So I cut it off, I let it dry, I take off all the side branches, and I weave these hurdles, and those make the ends of my garden beds. This is my, this is a RV pad here that's all covered with mud and stuff because I haven't washed it off. And the garden is going back this way toward that house. Um, so I plant these hurdles, these woven fences at the end to try and hold the soil at bay from coming onto the, the concrete. And then I, oops, sorry. I plant those with um, catmint and chives, and these are garlic chives, but there are other, I have the regular chives as well. Those have then kind of stabilized the soil at the end of the garden bed. And then I can go ahead and plant my vegetables down these rows. Let's see. So the other way I, I use wood debris is by just inserting all along the edge. These are, uh, my, my garden is raised beds that are kind of terraced. And <clears throat> so at the lower end of the bed, I put in these stakes every couple of feet and they're about eight inches apart. And then I lay all the wood waste, once again, from those shrubs that I'm cutting down each year. Um, I lay that in there once it's kind of defoliated and dried out. And then I build, the soil builds up behind those. So another way, that's just a, another example of how to use that wood waste. They're kind of cool. They're kind of these natural little fences um, that hold the garden bed up. And that's what they look like. There's my kale. Okay, and so this is one that's under construction here. And um, you kind of probably wonder why there's a toilet paper tube or a toilet paper roll there in my, <laughs> when, I, when I make these, um, you, can, you can actually make houses for bumblebees out of toilet paper rolls. So as I backfill this with soil, I'm going to fill, I'm gonna cover right up to the edge of this cardboard area with compost and stuff. So you won't see the toilet paper roll anymore. Um, no, I'm not hoarding toilet paper. I'm using it for other purposes. And so if you leave that opening, the bumblebee queens, when they emerge in the spring, are looking for places in the ground to nest. They will come to this, they will go down into this cardboard cylinder and bore in and use the toilet paper that's covered by soil to build their nests. And so I actually had success with this. I put one out in my front yard and I had a yellow bumblebee, a yellow faced bumblebee build her nest in the toilet paper tube that I had buried next to it. They, especially if you bury them next to a, a, a rodent hole because the bees, that's where the bees go naturally to look for uh, housing. They go to rodent holes. So if you think all the ground squirrels and the um, gophers in your yard are horrible and you hate them, um, remember that they're creating important habitat for bumblebees. Just, just another rant on my part. So here's a carpenter bee on the catmint that I planted at the end of those rows. Oh, yes. And here's a vision of the uh, 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 look at the looking up from the bottom of the garden up toward the, the higher part of it. The Spring Street down at this end and, and then our neighbors are over next door here and back over here over the fence. So those are my tomatoes. Um, these are some tomatillos. This is a bed of peppers. You can see the, the kale that's still going from when I planted it last fall. Uh, lots of stuff going on. And there are those fences holding up the beds. But I wanted to talk for a minute about the importance of not freaking out when you see, because people always say, oh, I know about yellow jackets. You know, I know a yellow jacket. Um, yeah, a lot of the things you see in your yard are not yellow jackets. And I just want to point out that this paper wasp, we, we all know that yellow jackets are just icky to have around. They're aggressive, they're nasty, they bite and they sting. We know they're, they're pretty much creeps. But they have a, they, they fill an ecological niche and they, and they provide ecosystem services for us. They are predatory. They hunt the bugs in your yard. If you can live with yellow jackets that are far away from your house and far from your garden, far from your kids and your grandkids, away from your picnic food, if they're out there in the environment and they're not bugging you, leave them alone. You don't need to hunt them down. The thing that you do need to be aware of though, 
is that some things that fly by you that look like yellow jackets are not. And this is a classic example. This is a European paper wasp. She builds that little thing that hangs from your, your porch from a little paper stalk and it has like, oh, maybe two dozen little, little larvae growing in it. She's not aggressive. She's not going to come after you. She is a good guy and I want to show you what this good guy, I saw her in my garden, I thought, oh my God, a yellow jacket, oh no, I'm going to have to do something, oh no, I started panicking. Then I thought, no, she looks thin, doesn't look like a yellow jacket. Oh, look, she's got really long legs that hang down. Yellow jackets fold their legs like a bomber and they come at you, right? These guys are going to put those legs back along their backs and they're going to fly like a bullet. Um, they have black antenna, that's a yellow jacket, and they have a broad body. This wasp has orange tipped antennas and these long graceful dangling legs and she's very thin. She's much thinner and less robust than a yellow jacket. And she's after all those cabbage looper butterfly larvae that are on your coal crops, on your broccoli, on your cabbage, on your kale, on your kohlrabi, she's coming and hunting those because she's a European paper wasp and she's looking on European old world crops for her prey item. So here she is. I looked at this girl and I saw her flying around my Brussels sprouts and I watched her on my pick up something and fly to my raspberries. Do you guys all see that little green sausage underneath her belly? That's a cabbage looper moth butterfly larva. She's picking those off. She's doing a service for me. And she's eating that little sucker. And so she is welcome in my yard. I love this. I was out there for like 10 minutes gloating and filming her. So there you go. That's how I spend my time. <laughs> in my garden. She's crazy. She's nuts. Uh oh. Now I gotta get back. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Yeah, whether I can get back or not is a whole different thing. Sorry about that. Let's see. I can't access my top. Oh, there it is. There we go. We're back. Okay. It takes me a while sometimes. Sorry. My apologies. So don't, don't go just indiscriminately killing everything that's yellow and black and goes flying by you in the garden. There's just another look down towards Spring Street. This is our back fence. These are some heirloom beans that I'm growing, more of that um, kale. There's the catmint in bloom at the end of all the garden beds. There are blackberries on the fence. These are boysenberries in the next row up. And along this fence at the back, which you can't really see very well right here, are raspberries. So there's, yeah, there's the fence, but then the raspberries start here and go this way. <coughs> My husband, once again, has lots of things that he's growing in pots, fig trees, persimmon trees, blueberries. Um, this is that pipe vine I was talking about with the pretty uh, blue, hopefully blue swallowtail butterfly that we're hoping comes by and lays her eggs. Um, there it is again. This is the dry, this is what we use our RV um, driveway for. All the blueberries and the figs and, and the potted, potted food plants. This is um, garden sorrel, which is a really good year round green that I recommend everybody grow. Um, tastes like lemony spinach, it's really good. This is a bay tree, so bay laurel, that herb that you use in your kitchen, why would you buy it at the store when you can grow it in your yard? That's just crazy. This is our grape arbor, another fence with some pipe vine. Um, this is a look down the side of our greenhouse. Uh, one more, once more, this is, you know, stuff my husband's growing. He likes bamboo. I've got to uh, figure out a way to kill that without getting a divorce, but um, <laughs> bamboo is awful. Don't ever plant bamboo. He's got it in pots, so it's contained, but it's worthless. Post nothing. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is a low quat tree. 
Um, there's a crab apple tree, lots more stuff in pots. He's growing like crazy back there. There he is with his greenhouse and more fruit trees. That's a grape arbor that he built. That's why I keep him around because he does this great stuff for me. Um, and then a shot looking back at the house from the back of the garden, um, down those garden beds. Oh, oh yes, I forgot these. These are, um, these are other little bees. They look like honeybees, don't they? They're not, they're squash bees. They only go to squash blossoms. They're specialists on squash pollen. They have to have that pollen to feed their young, but I have to show you how cute they are when they get moving because they get in the flower and they just, and they just roll around in groups like this and they just, <laughs> they're so cute. And they just collect, like they're just gathering all the pollen out of that flower because they have to provision their nest. Adorable. All right. Um, yeah, just more views up the garden and close-ups of the tomatillos and peppers and tomatoes. And that's August in the garden. And then a final shot of my raspberries that go until frost. Um, I, I was eating raspberries a week ago out of my garden. They're right along that back fence. All right. So there it is. Thank you all for visiting my garden. <laughs> I hope you weren't too appalled. <laughs> it's pretty rampant. Um, once again, if you want a, present, uh, a copy of the presentation, I'll send you a PDF. You just need to um, contact me and donate to Master Gardeners if you like what you saw and you feel so inclined. Certainly not anything we expect. And then if I couldn't answer any questions about, if you, if you have questions about plant problems, this occurred in one of our last um, presentations, you can go to our Jackson County Master Gardener Clinic, plant clinic, and send a picture of a plant problem that you're having and they'll answer it um, via email for you. And then there are just some resources here. Um, at the end of the presentation, if you're interested in learning more about um, the, things that, the things that I've been studying to be able to do this. So um, here's my email and I'm happy to answer any more questions you have. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. This is this is awesome. Uh, it's amazing. It is just uh, oh, I've written written down quite a quite a list of plants. Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, so uh, we do have some questions here. First, do you have grasshoppers? Not many. I haven't noticed a lot in my yard. I, in other years, I've had more. I didn't see a lot this year. Uh, and uh, next question, does the loquat overwinter outside? It does. It's very hardy. Um, yes, it just stays out. That's great. And final question, what kind of evergreen vine do you recommend to grow on a trellis in a very sunny spot, southern exposure? Something that's a good pollinator. <sighs> yeah, you know, I would have to research that because I don't, I am not that familiar with vines. And I'm not sure that many of our native vines are evergreen. I think most of our native vines are deciduous. So I, you would have to, I would have to Google that and see if there are any that are evergreen. I, I am just not that familiar with, vine, with the vining natives. Um, I'm thinking of clematis, but I know it, it loses its leaves. So um, yeah. It looks like a Marcy wrote, evergreen clematis. She just there you jumped. go. Evergreen yeah. clematis, but that's probably a non-native. I don't know, but you could, but you could see, you know, I mean, you could, you could, uh, you could Google around. That's what <laughs> I do when I don't know something. I, I start Googling around. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Well, I, I've got a lot of Googling to do myself. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> And thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And I, and I want to thank everyone for participating and Rebecca for spearheading and organizing everything. All right. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.